And now, this morning when I preached at the nine o'clock service, there was a good deal of agreement with me. Uh, by the way, I started the sermon. I said that when you come to your senior years, one mark of coming to your senior years is that you'll be in a conversation and you'll be telling a story and halfway through the story, you've really forgotten why you're telling the story. And so you decide, no, I'll keep going and maybe by the end of the story, I'll remember why I'm telling the story. So you keep going. You probably noticed this at morning tea. So I keep going and at the end, if I don't remember why I've told you the story, I say, look, I can't remember why I've told you that story. And if you're a friendly listener, you'll give me the context. Every story needs a context. So recently, I was talking to a bloke in King Street, Newtown. He told me that a fellow had been stopped one night there. They took his phone and his wallet and they beat him up. And you say, well, so what? Exactly. So what? The story needs a context. And Luke, our author here, tells us in the very first chapter, Luke chapter 1, that he's writing for his patron, a man by the name of Theophilus, and he wants Theophilus to have certainty of the things that Luke's writing about. And Luke says, I've done my research, but I've given you an ordered structure. I've given you a consecutive series of events. So Theophilus, I want you to note particularly the, the context of what I have written for you. And it's interesting that this parable which we're looking at today, the parable of the Good Samaritan, that's what we call it, is only found in Luke's Gospel. It's not found in Matthew, Mark or John. And if you notice that when Darcy read, he read from verse 21 to verse 42, and it's a lot of verses, and yet the parable itself only occupies six verses. So context is important. Now let me say at the outset, it is good to be kind and good. Scripture makes that quite clear. The people of God are to be good and kind. But I do not believe that that is the point here. Whereas we all know the parable of the Good Samaritan, most people would know it. I think it is very poorly understood because we seek to understand it and we rip it out of its context. Luke deliberately gives us a consecutive series. He gives us an ordered account. He puts the parable in its context. And I want you to notice here that the parable is a lawyer, an expert in the law, asking Jesus the very most important of questions, and we are told that he asks Jesus two questions, and we're told the motivation behind each question. So if you've got your Bibles there, please open them and follow me, uh, because it's essential that we understand what this parable is about, and a great way to finish our study on Romans. Uh, notice at verse 25, you've got the first question. The lawyer comes and asks Jesus, teacher, that's a respectful title, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's the biggest story, it's the biggest question you can ask, isn't it? Uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And his motivation, notice, is to test Jesus to see whether or not Jesus is orthodox. Now, a lawyer, you would think, should know that if you're going to inherit, you need to be an heir. And nothing you do can make you an heir. You need, generally, to be born an heir. No amount of effort can make you an heir. Now, look at what Jesus does. He comes back to the lawyer and he says, well, you're the lawyer. You're the expert in the law. You tell me what the law says. And this man knows his scripture. And he sums it up, if you look at the cross-references there to the Old Testament. He says, oh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus says, verse 28, as if he was setting the test, this man set the test of Jesus, and Jesus says, you've passed your own test. Correct, he says. These are the two greatest commandments. Do this, and you will have eternal life. Now, if you're thinking like the expert in the law, you're thinking, well, I'm okay on the God bit. I think I could love him with everything I've got. But it all depends on who the neighbour is. Is it a small circle of friends or is it wider than that? And notice in verse 29, he comes with a second question. And his motivation now changes. He's wanting to justify himself, not test Jesus. He says, who is my neighbour? If I'm to love my neighbour in order to have eternal life, who is my neighbour? Now, friends, this is why we are told the parable. How can I have eternal life? What does the law say? Well, love God and love your neighbour as yourself. Now, to justify myself, 
who is my neighbour? So I should be okay if my neighbour is my wife, my neighbour is my children, my neighbour is my grandchildren, my neighbour is my in-laws. Hey, this, this circle is getting a bit big. Can I love them all as I love myself? And Jesus now comes in verse 30 to 35, six verses, and he tells the story. A man, presumably a Jewish man, is going down this infamous road from Jerusalem. It's downhill to Jericho. He is overcome with robbers. They beat him. They strip him. They leave him half dead. Now, this man is listening with the lawyer's ears. He says, these robbers, no doubt, are scoundrels. Do you know who comes along? Verse 31, a priest, part of the temple staff. And you know what he does? He sees the man lying in a pool of his own blood and he passes by on the other side. He doesn't want to get involved. Typical priest, the lawyer might say. And what about Levite? He's next, a member of the priestly tribe. He sees the man lying on the road and in order not to be involved, because it's probably not safe to linger, he passes by on the other side. It's safer to be uninvolved. Do you think they loved their neighbour as they loved themselves? No, they didn't. And do you know who came next? <laughs> now, here's the nub of the parable, isn't it? Here's Anthony Albanese lying, beaten up on the road in Canberra. Along comes Richard Miles, the Deputy Prime Minister, passes by on the other side. Along comes the leader in the Senate, Senator Wong, passes by on the other side. Do you know who comes next? Oh, look. It's a red-haired senator from Queensland, Pauline, Pauline Hanson. She, oh, no, really? Here's Dave, he's in distress. He's lying in the road, our pastor. And along comes Simon, the Anglican priest, passes by on the other side. Then along comes Joel from the Baptist church, passes by on the other side. Do you know who comes next? Look, oh, it's the imam from the Lakemba Mosque. What? And look at the extreme lengths to which this man goes. And even that pales into insignificance when you think about the enmity between Jew and Samaritan. They hated one another with a strong hatred. And the Samaritan stops where the priest and the Levite didn't stop and across racial and religious grounds. Look at what he does, verse 34. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, two days wages, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Incredible that the Samaritan should love like that. And look at verse 36, because Jesus turns the question around. For the expert in the law, a neighbour is a noun. But Jesus turns it into a verb. Which one was being the neighbour to the man? And the lawyer can't even say the Samaritan. He says, oh, the one who showed mercy to him. And Jesus says, you go and do likewise. Now, friends, if you want to justify yourself by loving God and loving your neighbour, it depends on how many neighbours I have. But the Samaritan loved without regard to race, without regard to colour, without regard to creed. This is my natural enemy. I've been taught from when I was an infant that this man, this Jew, is my enemy. And Jesus says, there's an endless supply of neighbours. Though you love some, if my, dependent, if my eternal life depends on it, I simply cannot cope with loving everyone as I love myself. In other words, dear friends, this is what we've been hearing through the Roman series. The law as a way to eternal life is a dead-end street. Being an heir, there's no amount of doing will make you an heir. No amount of loving your neighbour will cause you to be an heir. When it comes to eternal life, the law, the Ten Commandments, is not the way ahead. Well, what's the context? Come with me back in your Bibles, please, to verse 21 to 24. Here, Jesus tells his disciples that the Father is the source of revelation. Look at verse 22. All things, Jesus said, 
have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. This is the Father's prerogative. It is his gift to give. Eternal life is knowing him, and knowing him is his gift. Verse 22, no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Blessed are you, Jesus says, verse 23, because your eyes have seen and your ears have heard that eternal life is not a human achievement, but eternal life is God's gift to you. How can I have eternal life? Jesus says to the disciples who come around as they see him in private, do you realise that eternal life is my gift to give? Now, you can imagine this lawyer coming home at the end of the day and says to, his wife says, where have you been today? Oh, I went out to test that new teacher, Jesus. Well, how'd you go? Oh, I'm not sure how I went. Well, what did you say? I said, uh, tell me, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you know, he said, he, he put the question back to me. What do you say? I said, love God, love your neighbour as yourself. Okay. Well, then I thought to myself, you know, it depends who my neighbour is. So I said to him, in order to cover my tracks, who do you think is my neighbour? And what did he say? Well, he told the story of a bloke going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho and who was beaten up by robbers, robbed and left half dead. A priest comes down and ignores him in his plight. A Levite comes down and ignores him in his plight. And then, then, then one, of the, one, of, one of those people from down south there, a Samaritan, yeah, one of those people came along and looked after him. Man, he said. And then he said to me, you go and do likewise. Who was the neighbour to the man? Well, I, I couldn't actually say, but it was the one who had mercy on him. So Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Well, what did you say? Well, I didn't say anything. Well, you've got your work cut out for you, haven't you? You don't even like my mother. <laughs> you see, what is a parable? A parable's not there to make the truth patently clear. A parable is there to open a door. It's an opportunity. This lawyer can hear the parable and say, well, wasn't that a good story? Or he can hear the parable as a veiled way of revealing the truth and come back to Jesus and say, well, man, if he was neighbourly to everyone, that means that eternal life depends on me loving everyone and I can't do it. And so then Jesus would tell him, the way to eternal life. It was those who came back to Jesus in private who asked him about eternal life and Jesus spoke and spoke to them. Now let's look at context. Look at verse 38 because what comes after this orderly account of the Good Samaritan is verse 38. Jesus comes to the home of his, friend, his friends Martha and Mary and Martha is busy in preparation. We can sympathise with her because Mary's not helping. Verse 39 tells us that Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him. And so Martha comes and tells Jesus, my sister's here, she's not helping me, tell her to help me. And then look at verse 41. It's one of those occasions in scripture, you know, when something solemn is about to be said. Moses, Moses, the solemn repetition of the name. Saul, Saul, Simon, Simon. Martha, Martha. And Jesus is about to tell Martha the essence of discipleship. One thing is necessary for a disciple to have this body language, to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him. Mary has chosen the good portion. Jesus says Mary has chosen the better. Mary made a definite choice. One thing is necessary. She sits at the feet of Jesus and she listens to him because Jesus is the one who can give her entrance to eternal life. It's a great truth. Uh, when Dave invited me to preach today, he said I could either sum up Romans or preach a parable. And after a while of thinking about that, I thought, well, I could preach a parable that actually sums up Romans. And this parable sums up Romans. Remember what we saw in Romans chapter 3, verse 20? No human being will be justified in his sight by works of the law. We cannot, no matter how good we are, we cannot work ourselves into a right relationship with God. The law is not intended to be the source of eternal life. 
eternal life, God's gift. And he gives it generously to those who come before him and kneel at his feet and ask him for the gift. And he will give it to you. Uh, in the both New Testament and Old Testament, the people of God are to be good and kind. It is the fruit of being God's people. But that is not what this parable is about. It is about if you're working to inherit eternal life, it is an impossible quest. Dear friends, religion is a bully. Because religion sets you a task that you are to do these things. And then it threatens you with great punishment if you don't do these things. Makes impossible demands. And then tells us if we can't do it, then there's awful eternal punishment for us. But God doesn't do that. Scripture doesn't do that. Come with me to page 1752. 1752 and it's Romans chapter 6. And I think the verse really that could sum up the whole letter to Romans. 1752, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Let's allow scripture to interpret scripture. As Rachel has already told us in the children's talk, for the wages of sin, going our own way, creating our own idols, it is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And that gift is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Come to his feet, sit at his feet, trust him, follow him, ask him for eternal life, and he will give it to you. There is only one way to be an heir in God's family, and that is to be born into the family, to have Jesus Christ as our elder brother, to be a co-heir with Jesus and to join the family of co-heirs. And how do you do that? You simply say, I'm not worthy to come before you. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. Please, Lord Jesus, give me the gift of eternal life. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you for all that he is and all that he has done. And we thank you that our relationship with you is permanent and it is by grace, and we can have full assurance because it is based on who he is and what he has done. Martha, Martha, few things are needed, only one. Mary has chosen the better, and it will not be taken from her. We praise and thank you for the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.